Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the evolution of human consciousness. With me in the studio is Dr. Robert Ornstein, the president of the Institute for the Study of Human Knowledge. Dr. Ornstein lectures at Stanford University and at the University of California in San Francisco. He's also the author or co-author of 19 books, including The Psychology of Consciousness, Multi-Mind, The Psychology of Meditation, and the evolution of human consciousness. Welcome, Bob. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let's start by defining what consciousness is. It's, I know, something that philosophers are still in disagreement about. How do you define it? Well, I'll take John Dewey's definition, which is that consciousness is the awareness of awareness. We're aware of a lot of things <clears throat> in our life all the time. We're aware of our weight against the chair. We're aware of our breathing. We're aware of our heart rate. We're aware of lots that goes on inside of us, but we're not necessarily conscious of them. When you're conscious of something, you know that you know something. You're aware that you're aware of it. So that what you're prepared to act on at any moment is what you're conscious of. Mm -hmm. I guess in terms of the nervous system, it would imply sort of a layering where one layer is able to reflect back upon another layer. That's exactly right, because for most things, we don't need to be conscious of them. Think about it the next time you just walk. You are not conscious of every step that you take. And if you start to try to become conscious of what you're doing with your knee or your ankle or your instep, you'll fall. So most things are evolved to go on without consciousness. Consciousness is um, the cleanup man, really, in the whole game. It's the one that you call on to do something when you can't handle it with your automatic routines. Is this an emergency? Well, that's a call, if you like, in the nervous system for consciousness. Is this animal or this person or this situation threatening? Should I bolt or should I just continue on? It's a question of consciousness. What am I doing in this situation? It's a question for consciousness. Is this, is this something that's beneficial to me? Is a question for consciousness. But most things go on most of the time without conscious awareness. Well, I suppose from an evolutionary perspective, one might say, say that consciousness is a, is a property of, of certain kinds of developments within the brain itself that are uniquely human, I suppose. <clears throat> well, they're uniquely human and they're largely human, but you can see some precursors. Um, in some interesting experiments with chimpanzees, a man named Gordon Gallup in New York has shown that if you put a red dot on the breast of a chimpanzee and you have them look at themselves in a mirror, unlike the way most animals look at themselves in a mirror if they can recognize themselves at all, they just look and see it's another animal. A chimpanzee, if he sees a red dot in the mirror, will immediately look down mm -hmm. and knows that that's him, mm -hmm. knows that there's something wrong with him, knows that the information pertains to something that he's doing. So. That's certainly not human consciousness, but you can say that the kind of consciousness that we think of as human consciousness obviously took at least the level of chimpanzee uh, nervous system to start to develop, and it probably came in much later in the human animal when we have so many different layers of cortex, um, some, of who, some of which can be devoted to keeping track of what the rest of us is doing, which is why we have the most flexibility in dealing with the world compared to other animals. In, in effect, you're saying that consciousness is then associated with this outer layer of the brain and the cortex that right. can kind of look into the rest of the brain. And to redirect the nature of the organism, to change action, to, to basically 
countermand what's going on. It's, uh, <clears throat> its function is probably more to say no to actions that we initiate than it is to initiate them. Mm -hmm. now, the brain itself, though, evolved over millions of, of years, and our brains in, in many ways are uh, similar in, in quality to the brains of reptiles and, and the brains of other primitive organisms. And one of the things that you point out is that our, our minds are made up of many, many different subroutines that, that have almost an autonomous existence. You call them simpletons. Many people, I think from Freud on in the 20th century, have tried to notice the amazing difference between what a person will tell you that he or she is doing what a person believes he or she is doing, and what a person's actually doing. Um, Freud posited a sort of great pool of an unconscious with a kind of fixed agenda of its own, that it had a whole set of routines that were going on at cross purposes to consciousness. He connected it to Darwin, saying that human beings evolved to do all sorts of things in their ancestral world and these primitive primal urges still exist in us today even though civilization casts a veneer on top. He, he wrote about that very uh, clearly in Civilization and its discontents. In the hundred years since Freud has um, posited that view, um, the situation I think has become more and more and more um, complex, yes. that instead of thinking that there is an unconscious, we now think that there are hundreds of different unconscious routines going on in the mind, each of which have their own agenda, each of which have their own reason. And consciousness, instead of it being the director of a kind of rational being, is instead, I think, trying just to corral these different selves going about their business. Mm -hmm. What we normally think about ourselves, well, I'm a teacher of this, and I've, I've done this, and I've done that, and I like baking a cherry pie or whatever, you can think about that as, as unrelated to our real self as any one of the unconscious routines are. That what we think about ourselves is just as much an illusion as are any of the kind of non-conscious facial expressions we may make when we don't like somebody or body positions we, we have. In, in other words, the idea of the self, the self-image, is just another one of these little routines. Right. right. There is no true self. Um, there are true selves. And instead of thinking about us, an individual, as having a true self, which is kind of blocked by various um, either psychological problems or an inability to understand an unconscious, we should think about an individual as a crowd or, or more mm -hmm. like a team. So you can say, what is this baseball team like? Well, you can say it's got strengths and weaknesses and it depends who's up at the plate. In the same way, the mind operates um, like a set of different individuals coming up to take their center stage or if you want to take the more currently fashionable computer analogy you may have a computer in which you write word processing programs uh, w which you have word processing programs in which you write but then you can slip out the word processing program and put in a spreadsheet the spreadsheet doesn't have anything to do with the word processing program in the same way, the human mind just slips in and out of different routines depending on what's called up by the situation. Well, I think it's very revealing that if you look at uh, the state of theory in psychology today, so many different theorists describe the parts of the mind differently. You know, the Jungians have the anima and the animus and the shadow, and the Freuds have the id and the ego and the superego, and there's so many others. It's as if if you put them all together, you'd have this kind of uh, society of the mind is... Yes, I think that that's what one of my um, cognitive science contemporaries described it as. Now, Martin Minsky wrote right, a book by that's that right, title. That's right. Mm -hmm. And if you 
If you take what each of these either different traditions or different philosophies are saying and you look at all of them and you put it together with a lot of modern scientific research, I think you come to the viewpoint that the mind is a crowd. The mind is what I call a squadron of simpletons. Mm -hmm. I call them simpletons because simpletons in, in ordinary terminology means they can just sort of do some, one thing and they're not too concerned with anything else. You just you set out, they can polish the floor, they can, um, they can write something, they can dance, they can whatever. And I think if you think about the mind as, and your mind, as a set of simpletons with them not necessarily ever really talking to one another, you begin to understand some of the problems that you might face. You say, why am I always saying the wrong thing to him? Or, I wish I hadn't said that. Or, I wish I could be more loose and open with her as I am with this person. The reason we we kind of wish our minds were different is that the person who's trying to control the mind is not really that much in control of what's happening. Mm -hmm. That it's like saying, I'm part of this team and I wish X were actually in the center of the game right now as opposed to Y, but I can't get him or her into it. Yeah. Well, most of us don't normally think of our minds as, as a team, and if we That's push right. the analogy, I suppose it suggests that maybe one of these simpletons could take the, the role of a coach or, or something like well, that, or a conductor <coughs> of an orchestra. Well, I think that's, in truth, what consciousness tries to do. Mm -hmm. um, but again, most of the time, like with most of evolution, our automatic routine simply just slip into place. An advertiser says, you know, look at these two things. One of them is a tenth cheaper, and you think, God, it's a great bargain. Um, someone comes in who always gets you annoyed, and that person just appears. It's what philosophical and other traditions sort of call unconscious thinking yeah. or um, just sort of routine thinking. Um, but if you think about you're, if you think about yourself as having lots of different possibilities at any moment, it's a question of consciousness to bring the right one into play at the right moment. And that's, I think, what a lot of people really mean, although I don't think we've had the language to describe it until recently by conscious development. It's taking this rather dissonant crowd and getting some harmony in it. Well, one of the things that you suggest in your book, The Evolution of Human Consciousness, is that we begin to develop labels for these different simpletons within us, come to have a, a personal relationship with right. the facets of our own mind. Yes, well, I think that otherwise you're, you're going to forever saying, why, am I, why did I always do this? Or why do, I, why do I always do that? If you begin to think, ah, well, when he says this, I always get like a nervous Nelly and try to bolt. Then the, next, then the next five times it happens, probably nothing will happen. But maybe the sixth time you'll say, ah, oh, that's the nervous Nelly coming in, and you can decide, mm -hmm. should I bolt right now or should I forget it? Mm -hmm. It may be that it's the right thing to do is to, is to get nervous and bolt because he might be threatening or boring or terrible. But at least you begin to have the option. You begin to say, I'm the director, to shift the metaphor a little bit and get off stage at the moment and let's, let's, have, you know, let's have the band. It reminds me a little bit of the book of Genesis where, yeah. where God gives man and women the power to, to have dominion over the earth because it can name the right. various sure. creatures. And, and what you're right. saying is if consciousness can begin to name these various facets or subroutines or simpletons, then it has the possibility of orchestrating them. Well, I think that's what self-observation is really about mm -hmm. in many of the traditions that emphasize it. I think it's about knowing who you are. As I say in the evolution of consciousness, it's getting to know you's, not you, and not Y-O-U-S-E, but Y-O-U-S, all the you's that exist inside of you. Yeah. Now, I, let me digress for just a moment. You used the uh, computer analogy 
earlier about the computer with many different programs with, right, right, with right. different functions. Would you go so far as to say that a computers could be constructed that actually could be conscious in a way similar to human consciousness? There's a lot of discussion now about whether computers could be conscious or not. Um, I think that there are, there's a level of um, self-organization that computers probably could achieve. I think that for them to be conscious in a way that's meaningful, mm -hmm. which is something I think most, many people in the academic world forget because they can try to do something, but the question is, is, is what they're doing really going to tell us anything? I don't think um, that it's very likely that a computing system could be conscious in the totally bizarre, accidental, and inefficient way that human beings are conscious. Because we have to remember that nobody sat down to say, okay, Jeffrey Mishlove, we're going to design you to operate in, in a really reasonable way, I mean, uh, or, or any of the rest of us. Right. That we just happened, and we happened based on nerve circuits that got laid down billions of years ago and events that happened millions of years yeah. ago. So it's very unlikely that anything like this would happen again. Um, Steve Gould said, I think quite, quite well, he said, you could run the universe uh, if you had this giant model. Imagine having a model of what happened in the universe. But you could run the universe from, say, a time two billion years ago to now, and you could probably run it 28 zillion times, and you wouldn't get us. Yeah. So it's very unlikely that this could happen again. And it's very, it frankly is very mysterious to all of us. You know. well, one of the interesting things that you point out is, is that the enlargement of the human cortex, which made consciousness possible, probably developed for another reason entirely. We're very good at thinking um, that we're the center of the universe. Copernicus um, first gave us a great blow when he showed that where the, the Earth was not the center of the universe, Darwin and Freud furthered it to show that the um, human mind was not even the master of its own house. Um, some of the most recent and interesting research, I think, shows that the human brain, its distinction being a huge cortex compared to the lower um, centers of the brain, did not evolve for language for tool making, for rational thought, or for society. But it simply ballooned up before all of these things happened. When I grew up reading science, the idea was that the brain evolved along with tool making and along with language. Mm -hmm. But recent discoveries show that the brain actually ballooned up to its current size a million years before language. And it's sort of inefficient in evolutionary terms to have a brain that could guide a missile to Mars before there was an opposable thumb. That is, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah. The reason that we think now that the human brain got so big was simply because when our ancestors came out of the trees in the savanna, when the savanna in East Africa began to thin out about five million years ago, they faced unprecedented heat. And since their preferred method of hunting was running down animals, those people, those pre-humans really, uh, had a great need for brain durability. Even a rise of two degrees centigrade in the brain is enough to give a person heat stroke. So the brain is extremely heat sensitive. So it's thought the two things happened at once. The cortex got big and a whole blood brain cooling system evolved at the same time allowing there to be a huge amount of cortical growth, primarily at that point as an adaptation to savanna life. Mm -hmm. Now what I think happened was there our ancestors were walking around with this um, heretofore giant cortex. Then, it, then some of them had cells organized in such a way that they could make a certain kind of carving motion or a certain kind of tongue movements were possible, and, the, and then all of those things got more and more selected. But I think the fundamental impetus 
that leapt humanity out from the great, ra the great range of organisms that have ever lived was an accident. Mm -hmm. And then out of that accident, uh, we were able to adapt our brains for purposes quite different than the, That's right. the original. That's right, the original evolved purpose. It's sort of like if you take your computer home to do office work, you may find out that your computer can also run games or can connect up to a, um, uh, a phone network and you can do all sorts of new things with it. You may like the game so much that you may develop a whole new game which changes the world. But you took the computer home to do your spreadsheets, not to mm -hmm. play games. Well, let's, let's draw some more comparisons here between the computer and the, and the human biocomputer, so to speak. Because what you're saying, if, if I get you right, is that we evolved in a biological sense along with other species, and, and the function of, of our brain was to survive and to adapt. It had nothing to do with the, the, the uses that we put it to in the modern world. Um, you could look at the brain if you were walking through it, if there were a giant brain and you were a neuron, there was a Raquel Welch movie, I think, where she got shot up through the, the brain and body. Uh, but if you were that small and you could analyze all the things that were going on in the brain, and you could analyze them, say, at the rate of a thousand transactions a second, you could probably spend your whole life before you found any rational thought. Mm -hmm. Most of what the brain does is mind the body. The brain is basically another organ of the body. It's much more like a gland than it is like a computer. And I think we've been fundamentally wrong in trying to think about the brain as if it's like a computer. And um, probably I've given you too many computer metaphors to, uh, uh, to sound totally convincing. But think of it this way. If you get in your car and drive home, your car has about... 75, if it's a modern car, 75 different computers for monitoring the transmission, the fuel oil, etc. But none of those computers in the car are going to tell us where you're going. Mm -hmm. So while the brain has computing ability, the brain is largely much more like a gland producing millions of chemicals uh, for the body. And it is, as you said, just another way the body adapts. Now, what about the metaphor of the car? Where are you going? Well, where you're going depends on a different set of, a different set of coordinates and doesn't usually depend on what the computer is doing. Um, it's like the whole cognitive science view of the mind as a rational entity, which has so pervaded our education and so much so that people are trying to say what's wrong with our education is that we don't know enough facts, we don't know enough about our heritage, etc. Um, the reason that that's so dangerous now is not only that it's wrong, uh, but that it's going to lead us to trying to look at ourselves as if we were still at the phase of the Industrial Revolution. We're still at the phase where universal literacy, at least in Western society, was important, and learning how to do math, et cetera, was going to be, so, was going to be important. Uh, what's important now is actually understanding that our future is very different, not what our past was like. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to me that there's something really fundamental here about the nature of consciousness, to human consciousness, certainly, to ask that question, where am I going? A computer, I don't think, would ask such a question. Well, computers can be programmed to do it, mm -hmm. but and then people say, well, see, the computer did it, and then you say, who told the computer to do it? Yeah, you know? precisely. You know, I mean, yeah. have we found a bunch of, of, can you take a bunch of silicon chips and throw them in a pool of water and have them do it? No, some programmer has said, ask this question, jerk. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the way that's the way it's worked. It's quite clear that once the brain reached a certain point, somewhere past the point where a chimpanzee can suddenly say, hey, that's me here, mm -hmm. and modern, say, a modern astrophysicist, somewhere, maybe it was at Homo erectus, maybe it was um, at uh, Cro-Magnon, somewhere the, we, let me just uh, sure, interrupt. Can, sure. can you sure. define Homo those erectus, two? Ho, 
the, the line of human evolution started probably five million years ago with, with Australopithecus. About three million years ago uh, came Homo erectus, who had a brain almost modern size. Um, Cro-Magnon lived about 40,000 years ago um, around the south of France mm -hmm. and were pretty much as modern as, as we are. In fact, if you go into the south of France, you see them, and they're making the cheese and the bread and building the buildings. Mm -hmm. they're, they're us. Um, at some point, for whatever reason, maybe, uh, maybe it was because of what I call cranial fire, this immense ballooned up brain, we had so many extra cells, what Jalaluddin Rumi called a thousand forms of mind. We had so many extra brain cells that we could begin to reflect on what we were doing. Mm -hmm. My view, again, is that biologically was an accident, but once it happened, we had a new capacity. Once we had all sorts of cells that didn't have to be occupied in moment-to-moment -moment survival reactions. Am I going to get enough food? Do I have to hide? Is it time to sleep? Is it too cold out? Do I have to burrow into the earth? The thousands of things that every organism has to do. Once we had that spare capacity, we could start, those cells would start to reflect. And once that happened, the rules of life changed. Is it fair to say that when we reflect upon ourselves in this way and even develop intellectual ideas, theories, the theory of relativity or quantum theory, that in some sense the neural patterns are, are different at that point? I think they're slightly different at that point, but I don't think they're, I don't think that's the key. It, most of the neural patterns are based on the same old elements that the brain has always been based on. It's like, it's like saying um, the, um, the word eight, A-T-E, is fundamentally different from the word T, mm -hmm. T-E-A. Now, they're the same elements. Yeah. They mean something very different. And very, once you get up to a level of, in the human brain, you have probably a billion new connections uh, per I'm second. I'm going to need to interrupt you, Bob. We're out of time. Oh. But <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll have to leave this uh, random Somewhere. pattern kind of unsettled. Thanks so much for being with me. Okay, and thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.